So good afternoon. Um, thank you for for your attendance. Um, let me let me introduce for a couple of minutes uh, CELNET. CELNET is the acronym of Sarcoma European Latin American Network, and this means this is about um, reference centers in sarcoma in Latin America, and this is about about the um, a European grant just to support this this action and this is about a transformative work in each country in each participant country in uh, latin america uh, within this network because we are changing the the, the rules in, in in the sense that new policies of for referral patients new um clinical practice guidelines adopted by each country of CELNET is put in action, is put in action in, in every country. So in the end, these four initial years uh, have been transformative for many, many people. It's true that there is um, many things still lacking in, in Latin American countries. For instance, the, the poor access for clinical trials or maybe the difficulties for follow-up of the patients after the initial treatment, for instance, or maybe the, the limited access for uh, second lines, uh, systemic lines in, of chemotherapy. But I think these this, um, milestones will be afford, afforded for uh, as a consortium easier uh, than just country by country. So this is um, a history of of uh, achievements as well, and uh, is a history of uh, collaborative effort between different specialists. So thank you for supporting them. And uh, I will uh, also um, welcome to those attendees by on an online uh, connection from um, different countries in, in Latin America. So our, our program this afternoon is, is focusing on uh, angiosarcoma on one side, we will, we will focus on the histology of this kind of diseases and also uh, about the different uh, systemic approaches. And finally, we will also focus on retroperitoneal uh, sarcoma because uh, in the, there is an initiative within CELNET that will join different uh, oncology surgeons um, with experience in, in this uh, retroperitoneal space. And it's very important because as you know, uh, the kind of surgery we are offering to our patients is critical for um, better uh, results. And we have several um, official partners within these five countries, Brazil, Argentina, uh, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Peru. And there is many, uh, sorry, and there is also um, other countries um, that we call associated within uh, additional countries with Latin America. So the, the family is increasing over time. And this is a good news uh, because uh, there is a, a sense, a feeling of uh, needed to, to work uh, in, in this cooperative uh, faction. So um, this is the, this is not working now, but just the, the, the last, yeah, the last slide is just to, to share the, uh, the website of CellNet, which is a very informative tool for everyone uh, that wants to, to learn more. My, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our co-chair this, in this session, uh, Professor Paolo Deitos. Um, who will be in charge to present the, the speakers. Thank you for your attendance and Paolo. Thank you, Javier. So as you mentioned, we start with pathology and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Heidi Cara. Heidi works in uh, Mexico City, in uh, INCAN, which is the National Cancer Center. And uh, she will try to help us with the challenges that diagnosing vascular tumors always uh, represents. Thank you, Heidi, for accepting invitation to come here. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. 
So uh, the spectrum of uh, vascular tumors are very wide, as you know, is uh, one of the most interesting uh, tumors, I think. Well, there are others, but this is one of my favorites. So let's start. Next, please. Okay, so what do we see uh, now in this um, new classification from the uh, WHO fifth edition? So we have a spectrum of tumors. Some of them, them are related. Some of them are just uh, separate entities, but all of them as the first one you can see here is uh, an hemangioma. The next one in the liver is a, an hemangiotelioma epithelioid, and then it's a Kaposi sarcoma and angiosarcoma. So all of these entities are in the spectrum of the vascular tumors. Next, please. So what do we know? Well, uh, there are a few that are more common than the other ones, but uh, we know that uh, the places there are more common for this type of tumors are head and neck, uh, limbs, bone, liver, etc. But uh, the, the diverse entities can present in every uh, place and it looks alike, the uh, one another. Next, please. So what do we know? We, uh, for example, I took uh, just one uh, type of these tumors because they're very uh, um, heterogeneous uh, type of tumors. And uh, we're going to talk or uh, focus on uh, epithelial neoplasma. Uh, if you remember, we pathologists, we uh, address this type of tumors with uh, the morphology of the cells. So if you see this in this classification, we can have uh, different types of epithelial uh, tumors uh, all in vascular. So we have uh, the most common or the most difficult of them as, uh, is epithelioid hemangioma. The next one uh, it will be like uh, um, uh, um, uh, hemangioma epithelioid. We have uh, two subtypes and angiosarcoma that also has uh, a feature of epithelioid. Next, please. All of them uh, look alike. All of them can uh, be positive for vascular uh, markers, but uh, they're in different uh, types. So what do we do when we see a vascular tumor or we think or suspect that it's a vascular tumor? We think that it is really based on morphology or we, uh, um, after that, we have to do some, uh, we have to classify it. So we go and, and, and see where it can be, uh, if it's benign, if it's uh, intermediate grade, or if it's malign, uh, malignant, sorry. And uh, after that, we usually have to, uh, you know, make the diagnosis with uh, immunostrochemistry to be sure that it is really a, a vascular tumor. And the next will be uh, genetic testing. Next slide, please. So when we do uh, the vascular markers, we think that they are uh, all going to be positive, but this is not true because the thing is that maybe they are positive, but they share this uh, positivity with another type of tumors. So not everything that is positive for vascular markers are really vascular tumors. So we have to do another type of uh, test or uh, do a differential diagnosis. Next slide, please. So in the case of the first one, all of, all of the uh, tumors have uh, um, overlap uh, features. All can be look alike the, the other. So uh, in this case, hemangioma epithelioid can be in head and neck uh, most of the times, but also in bone and can be uh, um, diagnosis as uh, metastasic or uh, carcinoma, for example in these places, or maybe angiosarcoma, when it's also a benign tumor. Next slide, please. Um, I don't know what is not uh, working, but it has to, well, it has different features that uh, in the back, I don't know what is not working, but in the back, we can see the morphology. 
It can be uh, with a, uh, a lot of uh, cytoplasm. They can be epithelioid. They can be intravascular. They can be uh, um, also with uh, solid features. They can be in the bone also. Next slide, please. So what do we know? Uh, actually, when we see a, a very um, prominent epithelioid neoplasm, and then we see that it can be uh, a solid pattern. And we also have to think that it could be another thing. So what do we don't see? We don't see mitosis, we don't see necrosis, and it also is not uh, invading the rest of the, the tissue. Next slide, please. It can be solid, so it can be very confusing. So the differential diagnosis of this one is uh, very vast, if you can see, even angiosarcoma. Next slide, please. So uh, I don't know what is this, but uh, we have different types of uh, this uh, tumor, the hemangioma epithelioid. Uh, we have the, the one that uh, is also like a cutaneous or in the skin. We also have the soft tissue and the other one that is uh, also with very uh, uh, inflammation. So in this ones we found or is found that it has an alteration that is false B. But in the type of uh, angel uh, endothelial hyperplasia is not always positive for immunohistochemistry. Most of the uh, new features that we can find in the alteration, the genetic alterations can be now uh, found in immunohistochemistry also. Next slide, please. So now we have to hemangiotelioma uh, epithelioid. What are the key features of this? Well, uh, it's not a very good, uh, very common, but the thing is there is a intermediate aggressive or low uh, aggressive tumor that can be found in any place, but it has prediction for, uh, for example, liver and bone, lung, and can be metastasized. So uh, this uh, type of tumors has two features. We can see the ones that looks very epithelioid or the one that looks more like uh, with uh, very few features of vascular um, image. So we can see individual uh, vascular cells, uh, vascular lumens in the cells. And also we can think that it could be another thing. We could be it would, uh, another uh, type of tumor. For example, in the bone, if it's multiple uh, in, or in, in different bones, we can think that is, for example, uh, um, and a carcinoma. But this one, eh, I don't know why, but they like so much the, the bone. Next slide, please. The things that uh, Dr. Uh, Antonescu, Christine Antonescu show is that it has a variety of morphologies. It could be epithelioid, it could be like more fossicellular, it could have a, a myxoistroma, or it can have also uh, some kind of athepia or pleomorphism. Next slide, please. Um, here we have the different types of the uh, morphologies that we can find in this, in this type of tumor. Next slide, please. So what do we have now? We have two types. So the first one in the CAMTA is also a, sometimes more aggressive. Uh, it has a, less than 10% of the tumors. The one that we can see that is also associated with a TF3 is and jumped is also positive for the different kind of uh, markers or vascular markers. But uh, we can see that's also positive for uh, uh, cytokeratins or EMA. Next slide. So what do we have now? This is the two types. The um, behavior are kind of the same, but they uh, like to metastasize to different places. Next slide, please. So uh, we think that they can be more aggressive when they have uh, certain features, like they are uh, more than three centimeters and they uh, have more than, uh, I can ask it. Uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, more than uh, uh, five, I think, uh, 
in for, uh, no, three, three mitosis for uh, 15 uh, high grade um, power field. Yeah, thank you. Next slide, please. So the differential diagnosis of this type of tumors are, as you can see, many. Uh, the ones that we are very interested in is uh, sarcoma epithelioid, metastasic carcinoma, even uh, myopithelial mixed tumor. So next one. The other one that is uh, of our interest in this, in this case is uh, angiosarcoma. The features of uh, angiosarcoma are many, but we can see that we can uh, sometimes not think that it, it is an angiosarcoma or vascular tumor. Sometimes we can see that it's very uh, polymorphic. We have a lot of uh, epithelial cells and they can be solid. We cannot find the, the normal uh, things that we can find in, in a vascular tumor. And they're positive for CD34, uh, FLY1, uh, EGR, and uh, also uh, sometimes negative for CD31. Next slide. Next slide. So what do we know that we have to have for making the diagnosis of angiosarcoma? So often it uh, doesn't have really uh, vasoformant or vasoformative channels. Uh, it has a prominent nuclear atypia and abundant uh, amphophilic cytoplasm. And the markers used to be, or are most kindly to be positive, but I'm going to show you next, please. This is the differential diagnosis. Next, please. This is a case of sarcoma epithelioid. Next slide. Okay. If you see, you don't see the difference. I was going to put it together, but you cannot see the difference between angiosarcoma epithelioid and you cannot see the difference between this one. So the markers are exactly the same. They have uh, been positive for uh, citocaratins, is positive for CD34, for example. So what is the difference? Uh, sometimes uh, the things that we can use is FLY1 and also another marker. Uh, the literature said that we have to have like uh, two or three markers for to say that it is really a vascular tumor. Or for example, in this case, we, we can do, uh, uh, of course, FLY1 can be focal and uh, is negative for uh, EGR and also is negative uh, sometimes when it's uh, alterated with uh, any one. Next slide. So what about these whole uh, vascular epithelial tumors? Well, you can see it has a lot of uh, different uh, described uh, alterations, but also they share a lot of uh, the vascular markers. What are the pitfalls of everyone? Is we have to look for the clinic. We have to look for the behavior. We have to look for the mark of this uh, type of vascular uh, markers. And we also have that now we have the genetic uh, testing. But if you don't have genetic testing, what could you do? Well, uh, you can use another types of markers to rule out the rest of the tumors. Next slide, please. So where are we now? Vascular tumors are a huge uh, group of tumors, even from imagiomas that can be very similar to each other and uh, also the uh, malignant ones. Uh, they're very difficult sometimes to classify if you have markers or you know, have uh, a history. The immunistic chemistry uh, overlaps, as I said. And genetics is also uh, helpful for making uh, or ruling out some of the diagnosis. Some of the new markers are uh, related to the new uh, genetic alterations. Next slide, please. And so what are we uh, going to think? Well, sometimes uh, people think it is a new entity uh, that makes different uh, the uses of the genetic alterations make it different entities, or they are the same entity, but with different uh, morphologies. Because sometimes they share the same uh, genetic alterations and they are not behaving like the same tumor. 
So uh, what do we think? Well, uh, only uh, time can tell us if they behave like the same uh, type of uh, lesion or if we are just uh, making wider this type of, of diagnosis of this type of tumors. It will be all. Well, thank you, Heidi. Any question from the audience, please? Oh, Michael, please. There are some uh, clinical presentations of angiosarcomas that are a little specific. Uh, you have the radiation-induced angiosarcomas. Oh, yeah. You have also the type of head and neck occurring uh, angiosarcomas in elderly, which responds very good to texanes. Do we see anything pathological different, differing than no. this? <laughs> they are exactly the same. Yeah. It, the morphology is absolutely the same. Uh, but uh, sometimes, uh, for example, if we do the genetic test, it can show us um, some kind of alteration, but the, uh, maybe the clinic, uh, it can be related to that. But uh, in morphology, we don't have anything. I hope we can have something. Any other question? I have one Please. for Heidi. Thank you, Heidi, for your talk. I, I was wondering if we have any biomarker that can uh, anticipate the, the behavior in the context of epithelioid hemangio endothelioma, because sometimes patients are um, in, a in a stable situation uh, during months, even years. So, but uh, I don't know if, if there is some uh, pathology a biomarker that could predict uh, more aggressive behavior or, or not? What is your, your thought about that? Well, uh, sometimes when uh, you can uh, perform, for example, uh, immunosochemistry, if you know that is uh, TF3 or jumped, you know what the behavior is going to be. So it's more aggressive and uh, is more epithelioid, actually. And the, Another one that is CAMTA, and sometimes the behavior is less aggressive. But uh, as I, far as I remember, uh, we don't have something that is going to tell you that is going to change absolutely the behavior of the tumor in a particular moment. Yeah. And also a question for, for both pathologists regarding this uh, pseudomyogenic endothelioma, how difficult or how easy is to distinguish with the epithelioid? Yeah, right. You know, pseudomyogenic is a kind of, mm -hmm. kind of the new things, which is, well, the ironic stuff is that most of the time is spindle cell and not epithelioid, but yeah. you can, you know, sometimes names are a little bit crazy in our field. And I think the most important point that clinicians already know is that is a clinical presentation which is multifocal mm -hmm. and interesting getting into that in a multiple layer you can have vision in the bone in the soft tissue in the skin and and before we in a way understood what was going on people have the tendency just to chop off the limbs and then and as a meta study there is one famous case that francis Olnicek operated in mass general and then the patient got really, really upset when he read the, the paper. I mean, it's happened. So the message here, diagnosis can be challenging, but now we have a combination of expression of keratin, vascular markers, and FOSB. They get up regulated yeah. because of the fusion with serpin mm -hmm. one and, and FOSB gene. So I would say that in expert hands, and also considering the very peculiar clinical presentation, most pathology, I mean, it will pick it up. And of course, this is somewhat relevant diagnosis for, for you as clinicians on what to do. And um, until now, I'm not aware of credible cases that gave rise to this metastasis. So of course, I, have no, I think nobody has an idea whether it is worth treating them systemically. And, uh, but you know, we need time to accrue Patient. So I'm pretty sure that in the long run, cases with metastatic spread uh, will will appear. I mean, I, I'm sure it will happen. All right. Right. Thank you, Ed.
Thank you. Thank you. So the next speaker is Amel Dupres. Uh, she's a medical oncologist. Sorry, she's a medical oncologist working in, in, in Lyon and devoted to sarcoma care. So she will be in charge to the systemic approaches in angiosarcoma. Thank you. Amel. Thank you. Thank you very much for proposing to, to give this talk. This is very interesting following, you know, the heterogeneity of the biology observed in the heterogeneity we are going to see in the clinical presentation and so many treatments. And it's still so difficult to make the link between all this heterogeneity. So it's not that easy because we can see, perhaps I can look on your screen. So it works. Yes, it works. So um, uh, as, a, as a presentation, so I won't go into detail into this because we already had all this presentation, you know, that from the last two classification, there are two malignant vascular sarcoma and geosarcoma uh, with an incidence of one per one million representing two to three percent of soft tissue sarcoma and also epithelioidem and geoendothelioma that are classified as ultra rare sarcoma. So um, uh, when, when analyzing, and we will first start with the, uh, analyzing the literature for angiosarcoma, and uh, we realized quickly that there are two main challenges when uh, analyzing this literature. The first one is that <clears throat> there are so many uh, different uh, histological subtype that even if angiosarcoma are not classified as ultra rare, when you consider the location, the context of development, the biology, finally each subtype could be considered as an ultra rare disease. The second thing is that uh, angiosarcoma are not considered ultra rare enough to be analyzed separately, but they are not frequent enough, like for example, Leoma sarcoma or UPS, to be analyzed as an entity in all the large neoadjuvant, adjuvant, metastatic clinical trials studying entracycline or combination of entracycline and nifosfamide. And when you look at all these clinical, large clinical trials, angiosarcoma are always classified within the other subtypes category. So it's very difficult to know if they have a specific sensitivity to this chemotherapy. And that was the point of this retrospective study to question whether angiosarcoma had a different response to anthocycline based chemotherapy. So to do that, they review 11 prospective randomized, non-randomized clinical trial. Uh, they analyzed more than 100 uh, patients with advanced or metastatic angiosarcoma, all being treated with first-line anthocycline based chemotherapy. And you see that for the progression-free survival as for the overall survival, the sensitivity of angiosarcoma sarcoma is not different uh, from that of other subtypes of sarcoma. Only the fact to have bone metastasis or uh, high grade was a poor prognosis factor, but not the angiosarcoma subtypes. So after years 2000, um, uh, special efforts were made to identify the efficacy of specific chemotherapy in specific uh, histotype of sarcoma. And they realized 15 years ago that uh, paclitaxel, weekly paclitaxel had a specific efficacy in angiosarcoma. It was reported in this angiotax phase two clinical trial in which uh, 30 patients with locally advanced metastatic angiosarcoma were treated with uh, um, anthracycline that was given as first line treatment in two thirds of patients and second line treatment in, um, in one third of patients. So they reported an interesting response rate of uh, 20% uh, and also a progression free survival of four months, overall survival of 7.6 months. But was it, it is even more interesting is that when looking at the free patients who had an objective response, you can see that the three of them basically had a tumor that was not accessible, that was not amenable to a, a surgery and complete surgery. And they had such a good quality partial response thanks to the weekly paclitaxel that they could have surgery. And the three of them were in complete pathological response on the surgical specimen. The first interesting point is that in that angiotax trial, they started to question whether the 
uh, context of development of the angiosarcoma could influence and, and modify the efficacy of the treatment. So they were not able to demonstrate any difference in terms of uh, uh, survival uh, between the radiation-induced or de novo angiosarcoma. The, the, the study was not powerful enough to detect, but they started to question, to ask this question. Um, so we uh, didn't know if we keep at least, we don't know uh, if weekly paclitaxel is more efficient than anthracycline. We don't have any prospective data to answer that question. Only this retrospective study, multi-institutional retrospective study on 117 patients with uh, advanced disease. So you see that the two groups are not well balanced. There are more, uh, there are older patients and some more cutaneous presentation in the weekly paclitaxel groups. And the results report uh, an, um, a better, a higher response rate for the patient treated with weekly paclitax cells of uh, 53% compared to 29% for patients treated by anthracycline. So the author conclude that uh, cutaneous location, as it was over representation in the paclitax cell group, uh, is a factor of response to paclitax cell. We have to be cautious with this result. They are retrospective and it's not a prospective study. And also uh, performance status was the only independent prognostic factor identified in this study. James Aitobin uh, also demonstrated uh, activity in this uh, study from the Italian group, uh, reporting um, an impressive activity with two complete responses and um, 14 partial responses uh, out of 25 patients with advanced disease. Once again, this is a retrospective study, so these uh, results and this response rate and the PFS has to be taken with uh, many cautions. But also tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitor have demonstrated uh, efficacy in angiosarcoma. And the first uh, signal of efficacy was reported in this American trial, uh, which included 145 uh, patients with subtissue sarcoma of many different subtypes, among which 14 patient, uh, 40 patients sorry, with uh, angiosarcoma. And you see that uh, there were one complete response in the whole cohort, and it was in, the, in, in, the, uh, in an angiosarcoma, and five partial response, and uh, four were uh, partial response in angiosarcoma. Uh, the progression free survival was the best for the angiosarcoma. This is the blue curve, even if the overall survival uh, remained in the middle. And this recapitulates probably the efficacy of the treatment, but the aggressiveness and the poor prognosis of the disease. After this first uh, publication, a phase two trial was launched to study sorafenib in angiosarcoma. Um, so it was a study from the French sarcoma group. And here again, they, start, they try to analyze separately the different location of angiosarcoma with 26 patients with cutaneous superficial angiosarcoma and uh, 15 patients with visceral angiosarcoma. So there was an overall response rate around uh, 15%, if I'm correct, and a progression free survival that was similar to what was demonstrated with, um, with uh, Paclitaxel. They could not demonstrate any different, significant difference uh, of efficacy uh, according to the uh, location of development of the angiosarcoma. Finally, pazopanib has a, a notarization to be administered in advanced and metastatic uh, sarcoma. So it's uh, frequently used in angiosarcoma. So an effort was made at a European level under the EORTC uh, to study the efficacy of uh, pazopanib. It was a retrospective study. And you see that once again, they could not identify different efficacy of pazopanib according to the location of the, of the angiosarcoma and the fact that it was radio show already in a, in a near radiated area. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention, because all these uh, clinical trials I just mentioned have been performed in advanced and metastatic disease, and there are very interesting data. Uh, they are all retrospective, cohort-based at European level. 
um, to try to identify the efficacy of um, chemotherapy and systemic treatment in uh, adjuvant, neoadjuvant. We have many presentations of angiosarcoma with very diffuse infiltration, uh, not amenable to surgery that required a neoadjuvant treatment. And what is very interesting more than the efficacy in this trial, in this, in this study, sorry, it was not a clinical trial, is that out of 60 uh, patients included, there were 16 different regimen of systemic treatment administered to patients. So you see that there are so many different treatments and nobody knows what to, which one is more efficient than the other one. So it's very difficult to analyze that kind of uh, study and that kind of data. But the most exciting and interesting uh, development recently in HL sarcoma is uh, the development of immune therapy. So there were several case reports and small series. This was published, this one was published very recently in 2022. And uh, Dr. Ravi um, uh, report 25 uh, cases of patients, all of them being included in phase two clinical trial to receive pembrolizumab. And you, we can observe some very long uh, response in cutaneous uh, angiosarcoma on top of the graph, but also in visceral angiosarcoma. So once again, it's very difficult to know if the location in which uh, the angiosarcoma develop is uh, specifically related to uh, the efficacy of the treatment. Uh, you see that the progression free survival was uh, similar between the cutaneous and visceral uh, groups, but the uh, overall survival was uh, much longer for the cutaneous uh, subgroup for the cutaneous angiosarcoma. Sarcoma. So it's perhaps it tends that there's some higher efficacy of immune therapy in cutaneous and sarcoma. And this has to be done to be put in perspective with two other publications. Uh, this first one is the angiosarcoma project, which analyzed um, a large comprehensive, they provided a comprehensive uh, genomic analysis and clinical data of patients with angiosarcoma. And they reported uh, high uh, TMB, tumor mutational burden, in angiosarcoma compared to other sarcoma, and especially in head and neck and face angiosarcoma. And uh, they also demonstrated that there was a, there was a kind of um, a transcriptional signature very similar to that of UV melanoma induced uh, signature that could perhaps uh, explain this high TMB. Out of 10 patients with a head and neck angiosarcoma, they report two clinical cases with very long uh, control uh, disease after even uh, while being treated with immune therapy, but even after the interruption of immune therapy, uh, two patients with very high TMB of 78 and more than 150. Uh, also, again, another paper confirming, recent paper confirming this data, you see that in some very long um, um, uh, response out of 35 patients treated with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor, they observed some very long response, especially uh, when the patient had a TMB high, and especially in head and neck angiosarcoma, and also perhaps in lymphedema associated angiosarcoma. So all this data goes in the same, in the same way and the same uh, direction. You remember that from the TCGA data, sarcoma were considered to have low tumor, low TMB, even in case of uh, complex genomic sarcoma, like myxofibrosarcoma, UPS lymphoma sarcoma. But when looking more in detail, we can see that some pretty long tail in this very recent uh, analysis from NetSef, uh, especially in um, um, uterine leoma sarcoma, UPS, and angiosarcoma. And when they look at the TMB, the proportion of patients with TMB higher than 10 mutations per megas base, which, which is the threshold that is used in carcinoma to decide to uh, administer the immunotherapy, even if we don't know at all if this threshold is also uh, relevant for sarcoma. Uh, you know, you see that only two histotypes of sarcoma have um, uh, more than 5% of patients with high TMB. Uh, it's 7.6% of agent sarcoma and 6.7% of UPS. So high TMB, it does not concern a, a, ma a majority of patients but some patients perhaps can benefit from immune therapy based on high TMB. 
So uh, for uh, it will be uh, much faster for uh, epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. You know that the literature is, is very poor, and there was a, a special efforts made in 2020 uh, with a, a, a rich, um, uh, analyze of the of the literature. Very uh, com sorry, very a comprehensive analyze of the literature and. Um, uh, publication on this literature and also consensus paper to help to uh, manage the patient in the, the patient. And you see that from out, I'm sorry, out of uh, 56 publications, the large majority of them were only case reports. And when you look in details at the eight retrospective study, there are actually so many different uh, treatment in this retrospective study that you can wonder if it's not se several clinical case actually and there are only two prospective trial one assessing sorafenib and the other one assessing bevacizumab you see that sorafenib uh, both of them are phase two clinical trial sorafenib included 15 patients they observed two partial response nine stabilization and two progressive disease for a six month non-progression rate of 38 percent Bevacizumab in uh, the study included seven patients, two partial response, four stable disease, and one progressive disease for a PFS of 8.7 months, but it's very difficult to have any conclusion from this very scarce uh, data. So I encourage you to go back to this uh, consensus paper, indeed, in which they clearly said that uh, when the patient needs a systemic treatment, um, a standard medical approach is currently non-established. Uh, chem conventional chemotherapy for a sarcoma, subtissue sarcoma, appears to have very limited efficacy in EHE, and uh, participation in clinical trial is strongly uh, encouraged. So we absolutely, we globally don't exactly know what we have to do and what kind of system of treatment to propose to this patient. So as a conclusion, I wanted to, to demonstrate and to discuss with you, with you now. We, we don't know if anymore if angiosarcoma should be treated as should be considered as one disease or multiple disease according to the presentation, the location, the context of development, the biology. There are so many systemic treatment available, but none of them have never been compared face to face. So we don't know if one is more efficient than the other one. And this explains the heterogeneity in the court study that was observed at the adjuvant neoadjuvant setting. Um, and we don't know if uh, it has never been demonstrated that there was a correlation of some uh, treatment according to the, the, uh, to the presentation unless perhaps for uh, the development of immune therapy. Uh, immune, immune therapy. And for EHE, you, you see that the literature is very poor and it's very difficult to, uh, to give any recommendation. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Armel. <clears throat> Questions from the audience and from the ground? Hi, uh, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, just one question, because this has been also uh, discussed among uh, transplant teams for EHE, slowly growing without lung, um, of course, involvement. What's your opinion about the role of liver transplant for those patients? So it's not exactly the, the talk here in the systemic treatment approach. <laughs> but still, but, uh, just proven that chemotherapy Yes, it, it really depends mean. a lot of the presentation of the disease, the number of uh, the number of lesion, the location mm -hmm. of the lesion, uh, the evolution of the disease, the patient itself, the comorbidities. There are so many. I don't. I don't think that we can give a clear a clear answer. Uh, but Do I you think offer it, it in your center. Uh, yeah. Yes, we we discuss this. It's so rare. It's so rare. You know, EHE is already so rare. So the, the conditions, you know, just the liver EHE with all the required condition, it's so rare. So it's such rare discussion, but for sure, we are not opposed to that. Thanks, Thanks for the nice uh, talk. Um, so in, in what setting could you and would you use IO in, in angiosarcoma in, in France, in Lyon? We include patients in clinical trial. 
as much as we can, as, as much as we can, we try to uh, open the clinical trial. And, and so there are two kinds of clinical trial we can consider for the patient with sarcoma. There are some dedicated to sarcoma and different subtypes or different subtypes of sarcoma. And uh, we have also some clinical trial um, after screening for the presence of tertiary lymphoid structure. So we screen the patient and if positive, they can enter the, the study. And we also have some program with, um, in an histoagnostic way, not dedicated to sarcoma, but to all different kinds of tumor. For example, in case of high TMB, I have a MPNST with a high TMB that responds very well to immune therapy. So we try as much, we don't treat the patient with immune therapy for sarcoma, even in the in in neck, we don't do that currently, but we try to include the patient as much as we can in the clinical trial. And I don't think we can advise anything else at that point. I expected that answer, but it's good. And, and listening to your talk, it would also be interesting to combine it with radiotherapy in the, in the uh, skull, skull uh, angiosarcomas and maybe the new adjuvant approach, which is very successful in, in cancers. Hmm. I think so when you come in, I think going back to what Michael said, I mean, it's obvious that angiosarc is not a single disease and that clinical presentation, the genomics can be different. You know, visceral angiosarcoma is still another animal. So, and it is rare, so it's difficult to, you know, treat them according to the clinical presentation. But, you know, you show data that, you know, we are promising in terms of trying to find a decent biomarker for immune oncology, which is always a challenge in, in general in cancer, but particularly in sarcoma. Yes. Yeah, please. Thank you for your presentation. Um, TMB, high level of TMB is observed in all type of angiosarcoma or mostly in the angiosarcoma of the scalp in elder, elderly patients, because uh, here we have the UV uh, patho pathogenetic uh, uh, way. So from the publications that are presented, it seems that uh, it would be, uh, TMB would be higher in the head and neck yeah, and right. sarcoma. But I think we should not limit to that. It's so, you know, it's some cases, it's few cases, it's, you know, it was reported with two cases. So I think that at that point, we absolutely should not limit the TMB assessment, you know, in subtype of sarcoma or in subtypes of NGO sarcoma. And if we can, we could try to assess it as large as we can to get so to collect some data and try to identify which one. But yes, apparently it seems that from the, this preliminary data that perhaps the head and neck and face uh, are more likely to have a higher TMB than the other kind of NGO sarcoma. Just if, I think I agree 100% because I recently I had a long talk with Jim Allison, which is a Nobel Prize who got you know, into immune oncology. And it is interesting how them, also Pat Sharma, at MD Anderson, basically, oh, despite all you know, the fancy biomarkers, you know what they only get? Inter I mean, lymphocyte in the tumor is the only biomarker that they use. So it's probably we should learn that maybe we don't need some such a huge sophistication, but just to try, particularly with this easy, basically we don't have anything really working, seriously. So we should try using the inflammatory infiltrate, the T cell infiltrate as a possible biomarker in, in sarcomas in general, but in angiosarcoma particularly, because to the best of my knowledge, you see a lot of inflammation actually in many, many cases. So, you have the effector cells of the immune response there. So maybe we, we can even try. Yes, we, we have a, a cohort, a specific cohort of angiosarcoma in immunosarc, which is a phase two trial uh, combining sunitinib plus nivolumab. And we have seen uh, interesting um, repeat responses in some cases. And actually we have moved forward from the interim analysis so the, the statistical assumptions were accomplished uh, for this first part. So, but it's true that some uh, angiosarcomas are uh, sensitive, some others no, uh, and will be interesting to, to explore these potential biomarkers or TMB um, because it's a very heterogeneous population, but this will be very important. 
that there's a prospective study in the Netherlands as well. And I think it would be really nice to, to combine these efforts and have more, more patients and more data. Exactly. And is there a selection of the patient in this study or it's yeah, all there, kind of selection? There is, there is biomarker uh, biopsies before and after. And um, uh, the patients that can be included are the UV related lymphedema and, and the uh, radiation. So it's quite broad, but there will be material. So, um, very sad question, but uh, I, I think it's more for Paolo. For the pathologist, how, how to deal with the low grade angiosarcoma? Does it exist or not? <laughs> Celso Melo from Brazil. Oh, hi, Celso. Now, this is a long history. I mean, you know, particularly in the breast, there were evidences from uh, New York saying, okay, you can grade breast angiosarc uh, with some meaningful results. And then Boston people, Chris Fletcher, came with a large, large series in which, in the end, grading doesn't seem to work at all. So I think is kind of debatable. What do we know, honestly, that is, honestly, I would never, outside the breast, I would never use the, the you know, the label low-grade angiosarcoma because we are always dealing basically with an aggressive disease. So we need to be very careful in order to avoid that people think so. Let's, that is a nice angiosarcoma. There is no nice angiosarcoma on earth, but it's one of the worst diseases that we can, have to face in our in our community. So the answer is I don't agree at all. Okay. So more more questions from the audience, uh, Claudia. When when do you consider um, perioperative uh, perioperative uh, chemotherapy when? when dealing with a localized resectable sarcoma, if ever? You mean in case of uh, resectable angiosarcoma? Um, we classically uh, always favor neoadjuvant more than adjuvant treatment. We perform very rarely adjuvant chemotherapy. So in case of big tumor, high grade, extensive, uh, we perform almost always neoadjuvant chemotherapy in that case of, you know, irradiated area, breast, diffuse infiltrative, for which you definitely know that the margin will be very difficult to obtain. We also look a lot at the, the, the aggressiveness, the clinical aggressiveness of the tumor, if it's rapidly growing. Um, but we always favor neoadjuvants and grade size uh, and evolution more than adjuvant treatment. And what do you use? So we have debate because within the same center, we don't all agree. <laughs> um, if we really want a, a, a shortage of the tumor burden, we can use antracycline iphosphamide. And I think that weekly practice works very, very well for this irradiated breast, which is the most common uh, and the most frequent situation, or anthracycline, but it's um, TMB tumor board discussion. Okay, thank you, thank you Armel. Uh, we are moving to the last, yeah. Yes, now we're moving back to surgical oncology and then we have Dr. David from Chile. Actually, it's a kind of dangerous combination of Australian <laughs> genes. And you know, can you, surgical oncology have a tendency to be already aggressive. You know, if you have an Australian one, <laughs> it becomes a problem. <laughs> of course, I'm joking. And, uh, no, that's and, fine. Uh, and he's now, trying to help us understanding a little bit what happens with the surgery of retroperitoneum. We had a long, long discussion this morning, but actually we didn't touch base really on what to do when you get these kind of really challenging patients. Well, thank you again for the invitation for being here today. Uh, thank you, Paul, and, and thank you, uh, Javier, again for the invitation. Um, 
For those who don't know me, my name is Nicholas DeVert. I'm a surgical oncologist uh, from Santiago, Chile. Chile is this long, narrow country that's kind of falling off the, the globe in the south of, of, uh, of America. I'm in the capital of Santiago. And just as a reminder for Javier, when the Spanish came to uh, America, all the gold was found in, from Mexico south. So I expect the same thing to happen when you go back with all the cell net results, right? Anyway, uh, today I'll be talking about surgical resectability and margins, which is actually a benchmark for good oncologic surgery in any tumor. However, when we talk about resectability, this is an assumption. This is an assumption which is variable. It varies within centers. Center A may consider a big tumor as not resectable and center B because they may have transplant surgeons or other kind of trained surgeons, they will say yes. And it's also dynamic within the same center. Uh, and we've seen that in, in liver surgery that the disease that was considered non-resectable a few years ago, now today we, we're doing better surgery and we consider, they consider it uh, resectable. So if this assumption is what defines the odds of a complete specimen resection with favorable clinical outcomes, but it's a composite change in, oh, in the yeah. screen. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. So it's a composite um, of, of, of three variables, basically the tumor biology, which is a king, the surgical expertise, what I call the comfort zone, and the patient's reality in terms of performance status. So our ability to do the operation has always had to be contrasted in the aggressiveness of that tumor. And what is that patient going to bear that operation or not? Because we always have to focus on what's a disease survival benefit and what's best for the patient. So this assumption will be a balance between your surgical comfort zone, which has to do with your clinical training, your surgical resources and backup, can I do this or not? Can I be backed up by another team, vascular surgery, transplant surgeons, versus the, the knowledge of that disease? Am I op offering a huge operation for something that's probably going to be worth not worthwhile? And the other big term that's not always uh, talked about is the medical legal environment. So when we see strong private medical system, you see that surgeries are normally more conservative. There's the, the medical legal environment is much uh, more aggressive. However, your approach. And the, in, in terms of what are going to be the organs you can resect, uh, it, it translates your understanding of biology behind the tumor you're operating on. So that cowboy spirit, which is inherent of every surgeon, has to be counterbalanced by your understanding of the tumor biology and, and, the, and the status of the patient. We want always want the uh, best for that patient. So that has to be counterbalanced against our cowboy um, spirit. However, having said that, on the opposite, the extent of your resection cannot be limited by your comfort zone. So we cannot deny patients the, the possibility of a good operation because we think the Whipples is too risky that's related to the operation, because we need an IVC reconstruction, because we may need a major liver resection, or we may need to do an autotransplantation of the kidney of the liver. So that should not preclude your oncologic surgery. Remember that great things happen out of the comfort zone. So let's start talking about what brings us here today retroperitoneal sarcoma. I'm going to focus mostly on liposarcomas, or probably all this talk is about liposarcomas and lymas sarcomas, because together they are 80% of the retroperitoneal disease. So a few words on decimals today in, in um, intra-abdominal decimals, we're pretty much not operating. We're pretty much treating them with systemic treatment, uh, MPNST, in terms of surgical margins, does not really give us a huge challenge. However, the challenge is more with the tumor biology and solitary virus tumor is a tumor that has in the majority of cases, uh, pretty good outcomes after a simple resection. So I'm gonna focus mostly on lip liposarcomas and lyomycercomas. And the problem is that these tumors are normally underdiagnosed and they present when they're huge tumors or because of the appearance around these major vascular structure, they're always under, they are always considered not resectable. Sorry. Yeah. All right, right. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, so again, they're normally considered not resectable because what happens normally, the surgery goes through what I call the wow reaction for liposarcomas or what I would call the Yikes reaction for the liomycercomas. So this is the WAR reaction. So we can see here a CT scan of a dedifferentiated liposarcoma. 
And generally speaking for a surgeon who's not involved in a major sarcoma center, the first reaction is, wow, what do I do with this? And what are gonna be my surgical margins? As you can see here in red, those are pretty much the margins. This is how much you're gonna to have to plan your operation. This is pretty much the normal abdomen, which is probably a third of this whole diameter and all the rest is tumor. So you have to plan ahead of time, how you're gonna uh, approach this tumor, which are gonna be your vital structures and how you're gonna be uh, prepared if things go wrong. So when you're planning to do these or to treat this patient, first thing you need to know what you're, you're dealing with. So first things first, preoperative biopsy, pretreatment biopsy, hopefully CT guided will show us specifically which and what type of tumor we're treating with to give a more tailored approach. And then I'm going to go into something that's very debatable still is, is about how, why do we go in our approach in regards specifically to liposarcomas, which what's being called as a compartmental approach. So this study, which was published a few years ago by the Italian group, shows that when they started doing more wider operations, including more organs, they were getting less local recurrence. They went from almost 50% local recurrence in five years to almost 30%, so almost half. And that had to do principally, uh, basically with the well-differentiated liposarcoma. So again, extended resection showed benefit in low-grade liposarcoma. A few years before that, a French group uh, who was uh, guided by Dr. Bombolo showed something similar, that uh, factors that had to do associated with local control had to do were specifically uh, positive margins, tumor rupture, or the incapability of doing a complete resection. And this study had to do, or most of the patients, including studies, also had to do with our well-differentiated or grade one, two liposarcoma. So again, the concept of going wide was actually showing us that in liposarcoma, those with low grades would give us a, best, uh, a better uh, local recurrence outcome. You see here in the study that what the chief, well, Dr. Bobo at that time called a compartmental resection, which is this line in blue here, showed a cumulative incidence of uh, a significantly reduced incidence of local recurrence after a number of years. So, compartmental approach in tumor originated from the visceral fatty compartment. Well, yes, retroperitoneal compartment is by definition a fatty compartment. So therefore, the, this retroperitoneal fat is always contiguous to the urotus fascia and the mesenteric fat. Therefore, the, ma the, the macroscopic limits as a surgeon, for me who I'm dealing with this, is not always that obvious. I cannot really tell what's normal fat because I'm not with the microscope, I'm if so with my loops, and I can't tell what's normal and what's uh, uh, tumor, tumor fat or cancer fat uh, in a well-differentiated tumor. So probably the uh, concept of compartmental resection uh, gives a benefit to reduce that local recurrence. Uh, however, that expansive growth pattern in the world differentiated tumors becomes infiltrative as the tumor gets dedifferentiated, and then the limits between the normal fat and the disease fat is, is a bit more obvious. So is there a rationale for selective organ resection within liposarcomas? So here, or within any retroperitoneal uh, sarcoma. This is a study published for the American group from Harvard. And they show that generally speaking, in primary resection of retroperitoneal sarcoma, we do extensive resections, including many organs. However, the organs that are most commonly resected are the colon, the kidney, and the adrenal for the adrenal for obvious reasons. Normally the adrenal comes out with the kidney. However, this column, sorry, this column in, blue, in yellow here shows that from the number of columns resected, the number of columns that actually have tumor infiltration into normal tissue is actually the least, which is blue. So most of those columns resected had no infiltrative tumor tissue. However, I'm not sure that has to say anything about local recurrence because if we leave normal fat or we think normal fat behind because it's not infiltrating, well, who knows what's that's gonna happen. They may be differentiated and start growing as a tumor as well. And uh, in this part of the study, they proved that 
whenever the surgeon thought that there was infiltration in well-differentiated liposarcomas and lyomysarcomas and all the other type that they operated, it actually happened. However, when they did the, the, the organ had been resected because it was kind of limiting or somewhere around the tumor, there was never infiltration from, by uh, tumor tissue. So this is a good example. Here we're operating on a pretty big uh, well differentiated liposarcoma, and which is actually going into the pelvis and going around the left iliac artery at a point that it got a bit sticky. So in the operating room, I had to balance between breaking into the tumor to spur the vessel or go wide, resect the vessel and put it back together. So I said, well, I know how to do it. I think I, I do it safely, I do it every now and then. I'm, I'm trained for that, I'm, I'm trained at HVB as well. So we decided to resect it. Of course, when I presented these in a TARPS meeting, they all criticized that the well differentiated, I shouldn't have done that, that it, well, probably I shouldn't have. But it's hard to tell when you're in the operating room and this thing is kind of sticky and you say, well, I'm gonna compromise the margin. And I so it's always a one time decision. And I decided that point and see how clear the margin is. At least the artery is totally free of tumor. And look at this, we're gonna see here on the tumor, it's all normal fat basically, a big lump of fat that goes all the way up from the pelvis to the diaphragm. And let's go back to that paper where you say you should be spraying those organs that are not really infiltrated. Now tell me, how do I spray the colon here? How do I spray the kidney? I don't know if it's infiltrated at the time I'm doing the resection. I have to go wide, otherwise that patient's gonna have a local recurrence, right? And that's the patient on day 10. So I, I, I'm confident with my, my vascular research. There's no extremity edema, well reconstructed. The patient goes home walking without any troubles. So maybe I'm too aggressive. Yeah, probably. But again, that intraoperative decision, it's uh, in within minutes. How far I go, how far I go far. And this is the opposite. This is a de differentiated liposarcoma. And you're going to see when you say, okay, well, this is going to be sticky. This, is, this has infiltrative uh, tumors tissue around normal organs, and exactly that's what happened. This is abutting the stomach. You can see that that's the stomach, and that's the cura. So this big lump had to come out with the stomach, the cura, kidney, pancreas. And that's what happens. You have this huge resection with all the fat included. But when you see the specimen, the specimen that I showed before, it's not too different to this. So really, Though I have a biopsy that shows that this differentiated tumor, the end specimen is pretty similar to start to think about sparing organs when they have diseased fat is not that easy. And probably if you can secure that margin and you can do it safely, you should probably do so. Now let's talk about lyomysarcoma. This is my fetish. Uh, I, will, I will already recognize that I um, like reconstructed vessels. And uh, this, as I said before, normally when uh, it's first diagnosed, it gives that yikes impression in the, in the surgeon. These are tumors that uh, arise predominantly from uh, smooth muscle, from veins, uh, the mesentery, but in a big number of cases from major vessels. They're high grade tumors. They, inf they have an infiltrative growth pattern uh, and they recur systemically after multimodal treatment. This study uh, from the TARPS group showed us that when they have good, uh, good surgery and multimodal treatment, they normally uh, progress in time with systemic disease rather than local recurrence. The metastasis normally plateau at two years. So after two to three years, it's probably uh, the probability of having metastasis is, is, is lower. Um, but again, going back to that yikes impression, this is normally your first approach to Lyme <laughs> You have this huge tumor that's uh, some way related to the IVC, very next to the aorta. And, uh, and this is a big proportion of the Lyme isercomas. And therefore, technically, these are distinctive group that present surgical challenges, which challenges that have to do with the vascular reconstruction. So, if you want to divide for particularly the IVC Lyme sarcomas, the areas where these originate, there's been uh, studies that divide the IVC into four levels. So level one to four. 
Uh, resection and reconstructions in levels one and two are probably a bit easier from a technical uh, standpoint. Level one usually is just a repair of the IVC. Level two may preclude a kidney resection as well. In a few groups, they're doing our auto transplantation of that kidney and normal with a graft, but things get a bit more um, sketchy in, in levels three and four because the tumor may be in close proximity to the hepatic veins. And that's another, another story. So, Oh, there we are. So that's uh, what, I, what I mean. These tumors are normally uh, require not only the resection of the kidney on block, but also the uh, vascular reconstruction. Here again, reconstructing the whole length of the IVC with a Dacron uh, conduit. Uh, and we save margins. So the problem for this patient in the future is not local recurrence, most likely is gonna be metastatic disease. And when I was finishing my fellowship in Toronto, we went a bit more further into more into a few details comparing what are the outcomes by side of origin of, of the lyomas sarcomas, comparing those that originate in the IVC versus to those retroperitoneal lyomas sarcomas that originate in any other vessel that's probably from a technical standpoint of lower risk. And we merged two cohorts, a uh, cohort from Toronto and another from Milan. We made sure that both cohorts were comparable. Probably the only big difference is that the cohort in Toronto had more radiation as, pre as, as multimodal pretreatment. And, uh, and then we went uh, after merging both cohorts to see uh, difference in results. We saw a difference in results in terms of mortality, 90 day mortality. The group of Toronto had uh, two mortalities related to uh, auto transplantation, actually. So these were tumors that had been dealt with in, in, uh, together with the transplant team. And there had been two mortalities related to the level four uh, IVC lyomyosarcomas. But going a bit more into details about the bio, biologic behavior, in general terms, they have a pretty good five-year overall survival, 65% and 68% disease-specific survival. Uh, and when you separated, so when we separated those that were originating from the IVC compared to those others from the retroperitoneum, basically they show no biologic difference in terms of uh, disease-specific survival and overall survival. And as expected, both progressing time with uh, metastatic disease. This is 58% in the non-IVC lyomas sarcomas and 53% at five years for uh, the IVC originating uh, lyomas sarcomas. So if this shows a pretty good biology after resection in terms of recurrence, what are the areas of doom? When should we be extra careful? So the areas of doom for lyomas sarcomas will basically be those that are involving their retropatic IVC, or even those that, that, that grow, have ingrowth into the right atrium, where you're gonna have to look for help with the cardiac surgeons as well, if you try not to consider that unresectable. And probably another one that's uh, a pretty hard error to do, are those that are somewhere related or originating from the superior, uh, superior mesenteric artery, as this case that we did this year. This is a tumor from a patient that uh, biopsy proven Grade two lyomyosarcoma. Uh, you see this 3D reconstruction. There was no involvement of the IVC and non involvement of the aorta. But you can see here in white how the supremus enteric artery is actually going through the tumor. Most probably, this was originating from the SMA. Risky operation, risk of ischemic bowel. If we were doing pancreas cancer, this would be uh, considered non resectable. But because we thought this has a better biology than pancreas cancer, and because we may put the patient through neoadjuvant treatment and the patient shows stable disease, we'll say, well, is either we can't do anything else or we give you the chance. And so we spoke about the odds, mortality odds, and when everything was clear, the patient accepted and we took him to the operating room. Um, so this is, sorry, there. This is once we'd finished, we use the saphenous graft 
to do a bypass from the aorta to the mesenteric artery and to bypass as well the portal vein. This is before, so the sequence is the one left goes first. And this is when we are actually taking that graft to reconstruct and uh, as a bridge using the saphenous vein, as you can see there, uh, to reconstruct our uh, supremus intake artery. Now, as I said before, things may go wrong. We're all very happy. This is the first case that has actually been described in the country and probably in the region as well in South America. We we're all cheering about it. However, on day seven, sorry, day 10, he had a mesenteric stump blow off and the patient did not do well. So from that outcomes, as a surgeon, you need to acknowledge them and learn from them and see if it's worthwhile going through that again. Probably from a biology standpoint, a bad result, one first bad result should be very seriously uh, debated and see if we should continue doing it or not. We're not sure yet. So let's talk about morbidity and mortality. This is a report as well as it been published by TARPS a few years ago. This shows that in general terms, 90-day mortality after primary resection for um, retroperitoneal sarcoma is in 4.1. It's 4.1%. It's, uh, That's even higher than, uh, than pancreas cancer in uh, centralized centers. Centralized centers for pancreatic goduodenectomy today is 2%. This is uh, centralized centers for sarcoma, and that's 4.1%. So it's still pretty high. And in general morbidity in third days is around 16.4%. When we see what are the factors that uh, have a higher incidence for, for, um, for morbidity, we see here that whenever there's a major vascular resection that has a higher odd of uh, having a bad outcome or a major morbidity. And there was also a tendency of when you're including a pancreatic duodenectomy, uh, to have a, a worse outcome. Factors that were significant for morbidity were, of course, uh, blood transfusion, number of organs resected, and the patient's age. And these other publication from the French group as well showed that whenever you have to reconstruct an artery, just as the one we showed before, the odds of having a bad or serious complication is uh, significantly higher. Now, to finish, what can we do to improve our margins to reduce morbidity? Is there any role for multimodal treatment? So this is the first phase three uh, clinical trial, multi clinical trial that was published uh, two years ago. And uh, they randomized 113 pa 130 patients to upfront surgery versus neoadjuvant radiation for all retroperitoneal sarcomas. And this was uh, powered not to distinguish between histology and that was a negative trial. Um, so there was no difference in local and uh, abdominal free recurrence rate, if given or not, for all histologies. However, you can see here the curves, they're pretty much the same. However, um, there was a ten when they did a, a subset analysis by histology that showed a tendency at three years for reduced local recurrence for liposarcomas, particularly those well differentiated. So then Dario again, who is uh, very astute, he actually gathered that group of uh, patients and gathered the biggest group of patients that were not included in, uh, in this trial. Of course, that gave a better, a bigger uh, denominator. And he actually proved very well, and this was published uh, this year, uh, that for all hist histologies, those patients that were included in the STRAS trial, but now, including those that he called Strexit. For all histologies, there was no difference. However, when you divide by type or histologic type, there is a significant difference in terms of uh, local recurrence for liposarcomas and particularly for the well differentiated and the grade uh, one and twos. There's no difference for grade three DDF liposarcomas and no difference for LMS. So probably we should start radiating at least to secure or reduce our local recurrence in the well differentiated liposarcomas in the retroperitoneum. Finally, what can we do about the lyomyosarcomas again? These are the tumors that in years time are gonna give metastasis. 
Uh, this retrospective study published by the same group a few years ago showed that there may be a role for neoadjuvant systemic treatment in the high-risk tumors, particularly lyomyosarcomas sarcomas and de-differentiated uh, liposarcomas. And when we analyze what type of systemic treatment, the combined treatment of uh, doxa plus dacarbazine may have a role decreasing the, uh, or at least it may have a role in reducing the tumor size or having a tumor response before the operation. However, this was a retrospective study, it did not show any significant difference in terms of uh, overall survival and this uh, metastasis over time uh, using or not systemic treatment preoperatively. So those results are now under scrutiny. This is STRAS2, this is how it's been uh, has organized. So patients are now being recruited and the, this is comparing upfront surgery for those high grade uh, tumors, grade 3D, uh, grade 3D differentiated liposarcomas and lyomyosarcomas uh, versus neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy it will be dacarvacin uh, for lyomyosarcomas and ifosfamate both in combination with doxorubicin and then surgery. So those results will probably clarify the role of neoadjuvant and give us more details about how can we increase the resectability and improve our margins in this high-grade disease? So in summary, surgery is still mainstaying for curative intent treatment in retropreneal sarcomas. The R0 slash R1 margin has a well-documented significance in patients disease-specific survival. However, R0 margin is not clearly identified in well-differentiated -di liposarcomas, defining greater compartmental resection need. Uh, recent data supports the use of neoadjuvant radiation in the well differentiated in the grades one and two D, uh, DDF lipos to improve the abdominal recurrence free survival. Tailored neoadjuvant chemotherapy, as I just mentioned, may increase resectability and reduce these metastases in uh, these high risk tumors. However, that data is still to come. And finally, my epiphany. So, good surgical planning is always paramount, and thinking out of the comfort zone is always appreciated because your first approach will be determine what's going to determine the patient's survival. So get into the mud that control your inherent surgeon's cowboy. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolas, uh, for your talk. And uh, there is a uh, questions from the online audience uh, from Samuel Aguiar in Brazil. Uh, so congrats for the presentation. And what is your um, and the other medical oncologist's opinion about lyomyosarcoma or the differentiated liposarcoma considered borderline for resectability regarding neoadjuvant know, chemotherapy? Yeah, good question. I think, uh, again, the resectability it's uh, is this clinical assumption that is probably based on your center's experience with various type of resections, including transplant or uh, major vessel reconstruction. So of course, if you wanna spare the patient from a bad result in someone that probably has a higher risk of developing metastasis in a short period, as a, we have actually changed our way of approaching these patients by a general rule, we are giving them neoadjuvant treatment and then putting them through surgery as the patient that I showed with that SMA uh, lyomyosarcoma. sarcoma. So yes, in general terms, even though the data is still to come, we have moved forward before that and we're actually treating them with neoadjuvant um, systemic treatment. Yeah. In any case, it's under clinical trial now and um, maybe it's not the standard approach and should be discussed uh, case by case in, in the real life, but yep. uh, encouraging to enroll patients in the stars two as much as possible. Um, more questions from the audience. I have um, a couple of quick questions. Um, Michael? Um, one question and one comment. Um, uh, very nice presentation, thank you. Um, uh, how centralized is this surgery in Chile, in a country like Chile and in Latin America as uh, full as far as you know, since you know that centralizing is uh, shown to be very important for, uh, for um, uh, cure 
or, or there are many sites in Chile doing these operations or all, all refer to Santiago? Good question. Um, I actually started my presentation with a photo of Santiago, which pretty much tells you how the system works there. Uh, it's a very capitalistic country uh, with a very strong private healthcare system. So the capability of centralizing is very hard. Um, the US faces the same problem. Patient can choose where he wants to get treatment and that choice is made out of various things, including Facebook and Instagram. So in reality, the only way of, of probably getting cent a, a centralized um, habit is by creating, a pro I apologize for, for, for the concept of a brand that you provide the best care with the best results. And then when we make that visible, how we do and, 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 and publishing that is, is our way to do it and showing our results. So unfortunately, we don't have a healthcare system that, that can centralize or force that centralized care. And we have to deal with that every day by showing and acknowledging our results and of course our bad results as well. And that stands for all Latin American countries, as you know, yes, that they are no, no country with a very good centralization that everybody goes to some few centers to do this qualified uh, surgery. Well, I think the uh, I think it varies between countries in South America, but probably where the strongest private healthcare system is is in Chile and Brazil by far. So both countries do not have a, a strong centralized system. Of course, there's a public healthcare system where the patients can are centralized that they can still choose to go private if they can pay for it. Uh, then I okay. Hi, so my question kind of relates to uh, the preceding question as well as the cowboy spirit that you mentioned for the surgeon. So as we all know in Latin America, most of the reality is that the, the, the care is not centralized and we're still like a bit steps back in regards to we're, we're still managing like timely diagnosis and efficient referrals. So is there any way to build on this already existing network and perhaps like recruit more centers as well as working in any awareness campaigns that are directed towards the general surgeon and to, I think we can compare it to like bile duct injury that it initially was treated by the surgeon itself thinking that they could repair it and it has taken years but it's eventually been shown that it's better if you refer the patient to an HPV center and it's better for everyone, for the patient, for the initial surgeon and just for, for the whole system. So I think we could, uh, is there any chance of, of working in such awareness campaign directed towards general surgery and perhaps that could strengthen the 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 centralization and uh, building of specialized centers. Thanks. Yeah, uh, good point. Uh, we actually were based on the fact that it's very hard to convince a surgeon that he may be better off sending that patient to another surgeon because that's acting against the surgeon's ego and that's probably fighting against Goliath. You may be more uh, resourceful by acting in other um, parts of, of the referral, including the pathologist. So it's very hard to have a, well, it's not very common to have a, an expert pathologist in, in South America for sarcoma. So we have a plan with Dr. Paula Detos that if we can get visible in having the, the most expert pathology in the region, those patients are gonna be centralized to us. <laughs> Okay, just one uh, one quick question, uh, Nicolas or other surgeons. Uh, how how to deal with these patients that we are receiving after uh, unplanned resection, for instance, in the context of the differentiated liposarcoma, where the the differentiated component has been resected but uh, left uh, the the well differentiated. How how to deal with that? We we need to yeah. to make the re resection. Um, we we should wait for a progressive disease or what is the so if this is so yeah it is so if there is a residual disease after a whoops operation whoops operation meaning you went for something a and it ended up being something b and that normally happens uh after an a, a euro a, a, urologic operation when they thought that this big lump around the kidney was a renal sarcosinoma and ended up being a de-differentiated sarcoma 
Uh, and, and, and also happens a fair bit with uh, gynecologic surgeries when they think it's just a fibroid and ends up being a lyomyosarcoma. sarcoma. So those, those patients are normally referred because once the problem is there, now the, patient, the surgeon doesn't want to really want to continue dealing with that problem. So then he refers it. So we deal with a lot of that. And, uh, and then again, our approach is tailored depending on what the uh, primary tumor was. If it's a high grade tumor, again, we will uh, tend to give neoadjuvant multimodal treatment because it was, it's now a disrupted tumor. This is based on assumptions. There may also be a role for radiation before going into the operating room. Uh, particularly if it's more of a well differentiating component that's being left behind. Um, so that would normally be a way to, to approach these patients. But again, surgery and the option of completeness, even though it's a uh, residual disease, is still the only chance for uh, prolonged survival. I, I won't say cure because most probably that patient's not going to be cured, but for a prolonged survival versus just leaving that to grow. So Nicholas, thank you so much. I think this closes the session. I wish to thank you that decided to stay late here. I have no idea whether there's like some reception at this point <laughs> somewhere. And of course, many thanks to our colleagues and friends from all over Latin America that got connected and contributed to the discussion. So thank you so much and uh, hope now we can go for a drink. Thank you. <laughs>